Well, good morning. I keep saying this. I said it in the Bible class, and I said it as we, I did the opening call. Time change. Oh, man. Seems like every year. I, it's kind of amazing, because this year, I actually was so prepared for it. I changed the clocks in the building before I left. We have one that, you know, changes itself, and I got all those changed. I, I went home, and I changed my clocks, the ones that don't change themselves, and I got everything ready, and I was like, wow, this is so weird, because usually I'm just so dreading it, I won't do anything. I just figure that my clock, my phone now will change. And I remember one time that we, we forgot to change it. Back in the day when you didn't have cell phones and you could not, you had to change your own clocks. I mean, otherwise, you, you just, you never change your time. Now, my watch changes it. My phone changes it, so everything changes naturally. So we got up one Sunday morning, me and the family, and we got to the church building, and we were an hour early. And we're so happy. We're like with three boys, and we're all like, wow, finally, we made it. You know, we got here early. So we decided, hey, we're going to go and get some breakfast. And so we did, and then we were late. We didn't make it back in time. We were like late getting to church. Of all the mornings, we thought we were so happy we made it, but we didn't. So what I want to talk about this morning is about hearing voices. You know, that's something that is kind of frightening, isn't it? You hear somebody say that, and you're like, really? You're hearing voices? And there's this uh, song by Chris, I think it's Chris Young. And I heard this song just recently again. And I want to share it with you if you read. Now, I took a lot of it. I didn't do the whole song, but I, I think I've got enough that hopefully you'll be able to grab this. But listen to what it, the words, the lyrics say. You could say I'm a little bit crazy. You could call me insane, walking around with all these whispers running around here in my brain. I just can't help but hear them. Man, I can't avoid it. I hear voices. Turns out I'm pretty lucky for all that good advice. Those hard to find words of wisdom hold up there in my mind. And just when I've lost my way or I've got too many choices, I hear voices. Sometimes I try to ignore them, but I thank God for them. Because they made me who I am. Now, one of the, the chorus is talking about how his grandpa, he, he talks about his grandpa, and he talks about, you know, some of the words that he heard and how that it affected him. And I know that we all have those type of voices where we're going about our daily business and something will come up and you will hear some voice. And almost exactly the way that person said it, too. It's kind of frightening. Mine, one of my first ones, when I started putting this lesson together, was my drill sergeant. Now, that was in 1979. Yeah, long time ago. And I'll tell you what, I still remember some very specific conversations. And I can still hear drill sergeant brothers, still know his name, Drill Sergeant Jackson, McFaggin. I mean, I can remember these guys, and I hear their voices at times. So we hear these voices, and they're important, because that's what this song is talking about. That's what it's talking about, is how that, you know, we have them in us, and how they have shaped us. And at times, no matter how we think they may be crazy, and we disagree with them, we can't help but have them come out. I know my mom has a lot of... You know, I still have this one voice of her telling me when I eloped and got married. And she asked me this question. She said, so do you love her? And I thought, well, of course, Mom. I can hear her saying that. Do you love her? And her saying, I say, no, yes, of course, Mom. I'm not going to marry somebody I don't love. She goes, no, you don't get it. Love is something more than just that feeling of goodness inside that makes you feel warm and, and fuzzy. It's something that happens over time. And I heard those words, and I hear those words all the time when I look at people today that are getting married and stuff. I hear my mom's voice. And I hear my grandparents' voices a lot, especially when it comes to God. A lot of things that my grandfather, my grandmother would say to me that just still kind of come up, and I can see their, their faces when they're talking to me and how much that has shaped. And I know that's true for you. Now, one of the most humorous, and you've heard me do this before, but I'll share this one with you, is from my Aunt Robbie. And she told me, literally, she said, she'd call me, because I stopped going to church. I just, I got disgruntled, or whatever my spiritual problem was, I just quit coming in. It was here, by the way. 
And I quit coming to church, and I stopped. And she gets on the phone, and she called me, and she was tenacious. And she got a hold of me on the phone, and this is what she said. She said, Ronnie, don't let a church send you to hell, because I was complaining. Blah, blah, blah about this and that. And she said, Ronnie, don't let a church send you to hell. You're not going to church for them. It's for God. And to this day, I can still hear that voice and how much it has helped me to this day remind myself that I'm not coming here for you first. It's for him. Now, when I'm looking at him, that, uh, that voice has helped me to understand something more, much more deep than that, right? Because once we see that and we start to focus, so that voice has always been a part and it has shaped who I am and it's shaped the way I interact with people. It reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Timothy, the way he talked to young Timothy. And he saw that. Paul saw that he had these voices that had shaped this young man. And he says in 2 Timothy 1.5, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. Do you think Timothy heard those voices? Of his mom. I mean, they were, they were kind of, <laughs> I'll say this figuratively, those voices were so loud that Paul heard them. <laughs> Paul could look at this young man and tell that, that those voices that had helped to mold this young man's spirit were still speaking out loud. They help us so much. They shape us on who we are. So my question is, what voice are you listening to? What voice has come up? There's a lot of other voices that approach us and we, at different times and tend to affect us all the time coming at us. And sometimes they're recent voices. Sometimes they're things that we hear on the radio or we'll hear somebody talking about and become popular. And then later on when we're not hearing it on the radio or hearing conversations, that voice will come back, won't it? And you'll start to retell it in your own mind and you'll listen to it and you'll think about it. And you know what it'll do? It starts to shape you. It starts to change who you are. So the voices that we listen to are very important. Now, as a person who worked in emergency services all the years I did and working in the emergency department, one of the most frightening things was to watch somebody sit there and hold a conversation with somebody that's not there. That there was, and not, not only that, but one of the things with audio illusion, uh, hallucinations is that with schizophrenics, that voice that they hear never is kind to them. That's the one thing that's very interesting. I feel so sad for schizophrenics when they're hearing those voices because those voices are always terrible to them. And I've been on emergency calls in the living room sitting there on the couch next to one and he's sitting there and he's looking over and he's talking and, he's, and, and I'm like, what are they telling you? And he told me what this voice was telling him. And uh, whew, it was horrible. And I thought to myself, it's not real, but it is real. To me, I could see that that voice was not important. And that the message that that voice was giving this person was not important. But in his mind, it was so powerful and real that he was willing to want to destroy himself. Luckily, most of us don't have that type of voice, but we do have it in a way, don't we? We tear ourselves down all the time. It may be, not be some mental illness. So these voices at times are so loud, from whether it's the local things going on in our lives, to our past, the people who have influenced us, to ourselves talking. I think that's why I like isolation the older I get. The, more, the older I get, the more I like going out on my mountain bike by myself, right by myself. I'm kind of antisocial. I don't know, because I, I just don't. I'm tired of the voices. It fatigues you. And it's helped me to refocus and think about it. And then when I heard this old country song, 2009 is when it came out. It just fired it up in me about how eventful these voices have had and how I'm trying to escape a lot of them in my life. 
And it started in the beginning of creation when these voices, these type of conversations start being pushed, pushed on us. And they're handed down over time. Throughout time, we see it happening again and again. And it shapes then that message that keeps being told and being told. And it started in the garden with Eve. Now, I don't know about you, but a snake that talks, I've never been able to figure that out. But she had a real conversation with something that we could never comprehend. And she listened to it. And I'm not picking on her because her husband followed right along with it. She had already heard God's voice tell her, don't eat of that tree. And when you do eat of that tree, you will die. Then she had another voice come along, right? And say, you're not going to die. He just doesn't want you to know the difference between good and evil. You know, for the longest time, I thought, that is kind of holding out on them, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's kind of holding out. Don't you think it would be a good thing for people to know good and evil? No. If there's no evil, why do you need to know about it? It's not, me knowing evil has not benefited my life one bit. But she had two voices that she heard. And it comes down to this for us today. All the time. Then the next one I find that I'm jumping on, and I'm, I'm kind of cherry picking some of these, but the next one is when the children of Israel are coming along and they're marching out, they've, they've escaped Egypt, and they're standing on the border of this great land. And God says, send in some spies. I want you to go take a look at that land. You know, he, he didn't have to do that. That's what's very interesting. It's almost like the tree back in the garden. It was like, there's the tree, eat it or don't. Here's the land, send the spies in, go check it out. Did it change from what God had told? No. It was exactly what God had told him it was. And they come back and they admit it. All 12 in unison, yes, this land is exactly the way God described it. But, man, there's some giants in that land. And ten of those spies said, we can't do this. Two of those voices said, come on, let's go. So they had a choice again to listen to God's word, listen to his voice, or follow these men. You see a pattern? There's a very strong pattern here that always comes down to really two sources of voices that we hear. We hear those coming from the world, and we hear those that come from God. And they're all in our little head, aren't they? <laughs> kind of going around in our head, competing for our time. And based on how you feel at that moment is the voice you will lean towards. You know why? Because it fits what you want. That's, that's the big thing. It, it fits with what you're wanting. So these men that reported and said, no, nah, we can't take this. The, the same results that we see that happened and the negativity that impacted humanity starting in the garden to then all of a sudden this, this beginning nation, this infant nation was devastating. Same for our lives. Depending on what voice you listen to. And you have a choice. But it's going to impact. It's going to have a massive impact on your life. So you think it's important? Absolutely. You know, you always wonder who people are listening to. We find that the world reached different points in history. From after the time of Adam and Eve. Where they would listen to God. And then they wouldn't. Now, the book of Judges is fantastic about that because it documents historically his own people that within a 40-year cycle for over 300 years, they cycled like a clock where they would follow God, they'd listen to his voice, and then they would stop listening. And as they would stop listening, it would start to become horrible for them. 
and it would start to suffer. To the point when they had completely stopped listening to them and they realized their despicable situation and how horrible it was, then they'd start listening to him again. And then God would relent and they would be blessed and they would start listening to him. And then again, the clock would start again. They'd stop listening to him again. That is a cycle of all of our lives at some level or another. Sometimes maybe it's not as radical. Maybe it doesn't go as far. But every one of us, we do the same thing. We allow external voices to affect our listening and then we start following one or the other. And they always produce something positive or something negative, positive towards God's listening, negative the other way around. And so Paul describes this process and what the end result of it was in Romans chapter 1. And there he says what happened in the God, how he treated the world towards their attitude. In Romans 1, starting in verse 22 through 24, he says, Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creepy things. That's the progress that it takes you down. You see, <clears throat> you can't listen to God and the world. Jesus said it in another way that's really more plain. He said, you cannot serve two masters. But I can listen to the masters, right? Can I listen to the both masters? Because that's like, well, I'm not serving the master. But you see, no, it's not that way. There's no gray area with this. You can't put your finger into a light socket and get just a little not shocked. You get it? You can't. And that's what we, we want to do sometimes. It's like, well, you know, maybe what they're saying is not so bad. Maybe it's, it's okay. I can, I can listen a little bit to that. No. No. <laughs> and it's not because God is so selfish and stingy and he's wanting to be so domineering over us. It's because he knows what's good for us. It's like my children. You know, why do we, why do we childproof houses? Because we're cruel and we're mean? No. We don't want them to stick forks into electric sockets. We don't want them to do certain things to hurt themselves. Now, from a kid's perspective, you're taking all the fun out of life. You know how fun it would be to take a fork and stick it into an electric socket? Yeah, man, let's have fun with that. <laughs> and as a parent, you're going, you have no clue, do you? Cap that thing off. And that's the way we look at it sometimes. It's like God has just taken away the best part of life. He's child-proofed us out to where now we can't have fun. And you know what we'll do? We'll take that same fork and we'll try to pry the cap off and get our fork in there anyway, won't we? And we do that all the time with silly things in our lives. We don't understand the effect it constantly is hitting us with and affecting us all the time. God's voice is always there. And that's one of the things that Paul said in Romans there. He was talking about how that God has always been speaking no matter how deaf you are. Because you still got eyes. And if you walk out. And you look at this world. This universe at night. During the day. It's just screaming at you. That there is a beautiful wonderful God. So. The choices have always been a problem. The Hebrew writer talks about it as well. Because he defines the issue that they were having. The Hebrews by the exact same historical event I just talked about. How that they had an opportunity. These people had been in slavery and they were being brought out and they were going to be put into a place of rest. They had all the evidences before them. I mean, how many Red Seas do you got apart before you get it? How many plagues do you have to destroy the most powerful nation before they get it? How much manna do you have to rain out of the skies that has never happened before before they get it? Is that not us? How many times does God have to show us before we get it? Thank God for his grace. <laughs> Thank God for God's love and his patience with us. But the Hebrew writer says there's a great danger and it's still talking to the people there 
In Hebrews, he just says very clearly, after he talks about that warning and what they had done, verses 12 through 15, but he says, while it is said today, in other words, right now, and I'm saying that right now while you're listening to me, right now, while I'm talking to you about spiritual things, and that's what he's doing. He's saying, right now, while you're reading my letter and you're listening to what I'm telling you, do not harden your hearts. And that's what some people do on all my sermons, all of God's word, Bible studies at different times. They hear things that another voice is telling them something different. And that's a hardening. That's a rebellion. That's a, why did you put the safety cap on the electric switch? That, you know, plug in type of thing. Nah. Because God sees that as rebellion. And he also then says that's why they all died in the wilderness. And he doesn't want them to die in the wilderness. He doesn't want you and I to die off in some wilderness, alone, lost, suffering. He wants us to listen to him. So much so that, you know, when God set up the kingdom... It, you know, it, this is what always kind of blew my mind. It's one little aspect of the law. All the detail God went through in establishing it. And as he gives, and Moses is telling him the law. And oh, you, you probably read through Leviticus, right? Oh, man. All the little details of the sacrifices and all the things that had to go through. And now the organizational structure was established as this. God was king. There was a high priest that would serve as one who would intermediate between them and God on all the sacrifices. And that was it. Simple. Talk about less government, more power to you. It's the best there could be. You had, you had a king that was, you couldn't get much more powerful than him. And yet, while he gave that law, he could see into the future that these people would stop listening to him and start listening to what was going on around them and they would want a king. And he wrote about it hundreds, over 300 years earlier. And look what he says about making that king listen to him. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 19 through 20, he says, and he says, And it shall be with him, the king, he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words in this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. You know, that, that's one of the things about the phylacteries the Jews would carry, what they would wear. I don't know if you're even familiar with them, but they would have a, a written part of the word and they would carry it. It's a little roll. And they wanted the word of God being close to them. And that, that is symbolic, but it's so true. That's how much they saw that the word of God was so important to them. And I see that being diminished in our society today. I see it being diminished in God's own children. And I see us following away and starting to listen more and more to the logic of the world. Listening to the voices of our social medias and all the things that are just just berating us constantly over. We're losing that love of God's word. You know, when you're in love with someone, they could say the silliest things and you would just, you'd just enjoy it, wouldn't you? I mean, that, that's what's amazing. When you're in love with somebody and you really care about them, you know, like, there, now I'm not going to say that, but what, there are people who, that I have seen that don't like me to begin with in my preaching style. And it doesn't matter what I say. If I make one little goof up, they're all over me. If I would not dot the period at the end of this sentence right here, or if I'd have a misspelled word, I'd hear about that. But would I hear about the greater part of what the message was about? Was my sermon? Did they know anything about it? No, but they knew I misspelled that. And there were some that would never bring up some of the mistakes I'd make and some of the, the floundering, like I am now, floundering around in the mistakes I make because they care about me. So they listen to what I'm saying. They value me. And that's the way we look at God. You know, we, we listen to If we love his word, we understand the power that it can shape us with. That that voice can take and transform us from what we used to be. 
and realize how different we are in the power in which he has given us to reshape our personalities and enjoy our lives and bring that value back into every day. And not some theory, not some book that we read, some philosophy, but it's powerful. That's why I like Psalms 119 so much. When he says in 97, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So what does it mean to meditate? <coughs> you talk about meditation. You're thinking about it. It's a voice. It's a voice. There's a lot of times that you probably don't realize it. <clears throat> Got a little frog there. Something will happen to you and some part of God's word will come up and you'll think about it. And it's instinctive. And, and I've noticed the older I get and the more mature I'm growing towards, I'm not there yet, that as life is happening around me, I hear those voices of God's word and they become a meditation. When, when I feel like everything is starting to attack me, there are times that I think of the Psalms about you feel like you're walking through the valley of death. And how that David said, but yet, yes, I'm in this terrible moment, but I'm not going to fear any evil. And whether you know the psalm by heart and everything about it, but these little verses come around. When I start looking at all the bills and debt versus my income, I hear this voice of Jesus saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough. But Ron, seek the kingdom first, and I'll take care of the rest. What a beautiful voice. And you know what? He's been right. But what do you do with that voice? Well, you got to get it first. <laughs> you got to have this voice in you first. And you have to want to listen to him and be in love with who he is and what he's done for us. So God's word is the one that we hear. And we start with that knowledge of listening and reading his Bible, listening to lessons and however you're gathering up through the Bible, his word. And that's the process that we see. It starts with the gospel that the apostle Paul talked about in Romans 10, 17 through 18. But I want to follow through with the rest of that because you're familiar with this first word, verse in 17. So faith then comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. But I say, they have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. That was written over 2,000 years ago. God, through the Holy Spirit, to Paul, saying that first it comes by listening to God's word. Listen to his voice and understand that that's how it happens. That's how it starts. But he says, have they not all heard? Are they not listening? Yes, they have heard. I have spoken. And not in just a limited way, he says, the whole world. Now, how did he do that? I don't know. But I believe that there's a God that's all powerful. But he said it. So we have to continually shape our listening to him. And, and what he is saying to us and speaking to us, that one voice that's so important. So i got to ask you, what voice are you listening to? And you need to ask yourself, you know, how well have you been battling with that voice? And understand that there are consequences to which one we're listening to. And there always will be. And this morning, I hope that you would be listening to God's word, voice and know that he is always wanting us to be saved. He's always wanting us to be in a right spot to where he can take us and bring us to safety. And the only safety is, one, starting out while we're living in him. 
Later on, it's going to be when he delivers us into the glorious heaven, that final reward. So I want us to think about his word and how important it is to us. I want you to think about your own personal relationship because that's what matters. It's not about my relationship with God. It doesn't matter whether you like me or not. It's a matter of you and him. You and him. Remember my Aunt Robbie? It's not about a church, Ron. <laughs> not about a church. It's about you and him. You and him. Be selfish. Want to be saved. So take this opportunity while we sing this invitation song to evaluate your relationship with him. If you haven't established one and the way the Bible teaches it is one, you got to hear and believe. Just like they did in the day of Pentecost. But after they believed, they asked the question, what do we need to do? And then Peter very clearly told them, repent, change your life, and be baptized in order to receive forgiveness of sin. That establishes it. That's what you need to think about first and foremost. Once you're a Christian and you've been baptized, it's not about going back and getting baptized because if I tell you what, just my life alone would run out of water. But we have a better plan, a better sacrifice. First John chapter 1, he tells us that we have an opportunity as a Christian in that relationship to turn to him, confessing our sins, and he is faithful to forgive us every time. But you have to evaluate your life, your personal relationship with him. So think about these things. If we can help you at all, let us know while we stand and sing. Watch and wash away my sins, touching by the blood of Jesus. Watch and make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I say, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that Makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow 